Well, sketch out for us, if you wouldn't mind, your base case scenario for what you're witnessing uh, right now. Uh, I guess how you believe the uh, the current conflict will resolve itself, what, what kind of equilibrium we're going to find ourselves in, and what that means for uh, capital allocations. Well, as I said, it's very difficult to, sorry, it's very difficult for me to say how this conflict will be resolved. And honestly, I was the worst predictor of this conflict so far because I really couldn't see the all out war happening. I know it was one, it was like, we had all this game, we had all the research people lay out scenarios, including the one that is happening that was gained, but it's in such a low probability because it just, just as I said, like I, people know something I don't know, but just as what central bankers earlier we discussed, don't doesn't make sense what they're doing. So completely leaving the humanitarian and ethical side of it, the moral side of it aside, strategically, what is happening is be, was befuddling to me. Like, and I am trying to find some now post factum strategic rationales for what is various what various parties are trying to accomplish and why they're trying to do this in certain ways. Uh, kind of like what negotiating tactics they're planning to use to get out of this. And there are several there are several parties here. There's the West, there is Russia, there is Ukraine. There might be some other more subtly involved parties, right? Uh, China and so on, right? How are they all gonna untangle this? Because I think like everybody wants to untangle at some point. Uh, but uh, again, maybe that's a wrong assumption. Maybe somebody doesn't want to untangle at all. Maybe somebody wants a twenty-year war. I mean, you, it's 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 very it's it's. It's hard to feel like there. Are, you can definitely see various paths of resolution. A lot of them. Um, I was surprised on the military developments. I was surprised. Now people were surprised by how to say the fierceness of fighting and the fierceness of resistance in Ukraine. Many people thought maybe that Ukraine will just play possum if these things happen, mm -hmm. or uh, many people, including myself, would think that if incursions were to occur, they wouldn't be so broad, and would just be restricted to certain areas so the whole thing just spun out into something that honestly i would give less than one percent chance probability if you asked me just a few weeks ago and how it's the different past the resolution right you could people just could suddenly negotiate his fire and find some kind of solution that allows everybody to face you could have russia gain significant military gains and then negotiate itself out of it and say okay well now we're there now we're gonna give, give us this and we're gonna pull back right are there are there any of those sort of cheap free hedges that are available out there or are they have all passed at the moment i think it's hard to be it's hard to be cheap or free honestly i will be right now if there was something free i probably would not be talking about this right now on a, right on, on on the broadcast that I full disclosure, if there was something very subtle, huge misprice, I would probably be first loading up on this and then Yeah, you'd want to get your position on and then you tell much. everybody. So, yeah. And I not really want to talk my book. I don't try to do this very much. Like I, I don't believe in like putting position on and then getting other people involved. I rather prefer because I don't want other speculators on my positions because they're only gonna mess me up. I just want to put position on and wait for normal economic forces to resolve. What I think is what I think is the different. What I think opportunities lies in the fact that various things are priced for various levels of Armageddon, and that was true of every crisis. It's true of September 11th. It's true of global financial crisis. I mentioned it in my books. I operated thinking about it during COVID. What you try to do is always sell what's whatever is priced that everything is honky dory, and buy whatever is priced as if it's the end of the world. That is kind of the approach, right? You think about, huh, there are some interesting opportunities in markets which are somewhat niche markets. Uh, things of just, in my opinion, for example, there is markets which are pricing, priced as if rates will never go up at all in the world, like I'm going to be zero forever. And uh, there are things which are priced in such a way that, oh, it's uh, really rates are really high and everything is great. So there is like all this disconnect, I think, Opportunities may lie within disconnects, and opportunities may lie within things which I think have very high probability of snapping back. Like uh, what I mentioned, for example, Eurocrosses, like Eurosuisse. I think it just has a good opportunity of snapping back. It, I'm just using it as an example, but it's not free. You could go five, ten percent against you. I just think like five years from now, 
assuming I, I see the world in which there is no war in Europe going on, hopefully, right? And I see the world in which Euro actually potentially is off the zero interest, uh, negative interest rate policy. I'm seeing Euro caring positively against uh, currencies like Swiss franc and being a little stronger. And so you're seeing some economic growth then? I don't think to something like 120 level against dollar because that seems to be the kind of historical magnet for Euro. Well, yeah, the PAYGO idea in Europe is thawing, right? Like you're starting to see even the most hawkish, fiscally austere German central bankers and government representatives talking about the need for, you know, um, pretty substantial fiscal balance sheet, ex you know, expansion, right? They're talking about pretty substantial investments in defense. And once you begin to open the door to deficit spending, I think we're going to find that once that once there's a foot in the door, that there's going to be a lot of appetite for more fiscal expansion and it, that that will, once the Germans open the door to deficit spending and, and fiscal uh, stimulus, then, I mean, it, obviously Southern Europe has been chomping at the bit for m Doing, the yeah. ability to loosen the purse strings. And I'm sure France would, would be happy to follow suit. And, and so, you know, if, if Germany is already making moves in that direction, there certainly is an argument that yes, we're going to see much looser purse strings, some a pretty substantial amount of deficit spending, major uh, escalation in economic growth in Europe, potentially relative to the U.S., and that could be positive for the euro crosses. Yeah, I'm generally yes, and I generally I generally believe that fiscal expansion, deficit spending, is actually good for domestic currency because a lot for developed markets, because a lot of people have this knee-jerk reaction, oh, there's a deficit and bad, bad for the currency. But the reality is, in the US situation, yes, US story would be like, we have a deficit, so we issue more bonds. Well, someone has to buy them, and to buy them, they have to buy dollar. And assuming that they are all not all hedging, right? They, they start on, a, on an incremental, it creates actually buyers for those extra bonds, which actually, it's kind of an extra dollar product we make. So it drives capital account surplus. That has been my kind of assumption. Maybe it is not very mm -hmm. substantiated because I'm not an economist, but I felt that historically fiscal expansion is actually good for domestic currency. And I think in Euro land, fiscal expansion would be good for getting off negative rate policy, which exactly. I don't think anybody really wants to stay at. But other countries like Switzerland are trapped much deeper in the negative rate policy. And, and nowhere in a hurry to get off it with your Swiss at 100.